Great. Hi, everyone. I'm Katie Dichter. I am a faculty librarian at Central. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Um, we have the recording going. We have a transcript available. To, um, if you want to turn on the captions below, if there are other access needs, uh, you can DM uh, in the chat right now, actually, your messages will only go to uh, hosts and co-hosts. So feel free to send a chat message if there are other access needs that we can take care of. Um, okay, Whew, I feel nervous. Uh, okay, I have a script, I'm going to read it. I am here with many of my colleagues and with Greta Triestman, a librarian at, well, all three colleges right now, um, who is my co-designer of this COSI series. Greta's currently on campus at South and I'm here at Central. Welcome to the folks who are in a library classroom at Central. I hope you're enjoying snacks and um, being in space with each other. Many of you know this, so I'll spin through it quickly. COSI is Conversations on Social Issues. We've been doing this for a while, since 2011. Um, COSI is centered in the library um, because the library sees its role in the institution as one that provides space and resources to explore all kinds of ideas and topics and to push us all to consider what we know and how we know it. We can grapple with ideas that may not have that we may not have encountered. We can be curious together about how they fit into our lives and our communities. These discussions are not um, to provide comfort to us. It's not a guarantee. Um, so let's sit together in discomfort and know that that's part of learning and growing. Uh, okay. In the community agreements, if you've attended COSI this quarter, you know they're there on the screen. We're choosing to center Palestinian experiences and ideas for the series because Palestinian voices have been generally marginalized from mainstream media. And I realized during the COSI last week that I should also say Palestinian ideas have been marginalized from scholarly institutions and scholarly literature and generally from systems of power in our country in the world. Um, so yes, read the community agreements. Right now the chat is limited. So I said that, that you can chat with hosts and co-hosts. We will open the chat after the talk so that you can chat to everyone. And we will, like we did last week, we will do progressive stacking for questions. What that means is we want to preference questions from students and from people who have Palestinian heritage. Palestinians are Palestinian Americans. And what we want you to do is to rename yourselves in Zoom with an asterisk before your name so that we know to take questions from you all first. And of course, anyone can ask a question. We're just gonna uh, order them in that way. Okay, whew, that was all the logistics. Okay, today's presenter. Dr. Maria Tedesco is here with us. I'll tell you a bit about her. Um, Maria Tedesco is an associate teaching professor of Islam at Seattle U, our neighbor here at Central. She holds a BA and an MA in Islamic studies from the University of Naples, L'Oriental in Naples, Italy, and a PhD in social and political scientist, sciences from the European University Institute in Florence, Italy. Her research interests lie at the intersection of Islamic studies, political theology, and political science, with a particular focus on contemporary Islamic political movements in the Middle East and the US. At Seattle U, she teaches courses on religion, such as Introduction to Islam, Gender and Sexuality in Islam, Islam and Politics, and Religion, Conflict, and Peace. Wow, you are so interesting. Dr. Tedesco, welcome. I'll hand Thank it over you. to you. Yeah, let me see if I can share my screen. So we can start. All right, so can everybody see my screen? Um, yes, okay. Um, so thank you. Oh, wait, it's not. It's not letting me. Um, move through the slides. Oh. Maybe I, if I can do it like this, maybe sure. it will work. 
Um, yeah, thank you so much for, uh, I mean, i sorry about this, but doing this, um, for having me. Um, yeah, and um, I'll start the, the title of the talk. It's Hamas Origins and Evolution. And so this is exactly what we're going to do, talk about Hamas from uh, its beginning until October 7th, and then we can debate the current issues or any other question you might have. So in Western political discourse, the war on terror is presented as a fight between light and darkness, goodness and evil, the civilized and the barbaric, the modern and the anti-modern. Needless to say, I don't find that this framework useful because it's so deeply embedded in colonial thinking. So I would like to propose a different framing for this topic. And in order to do so, I'm going to enlist the help of two great books. The first one is The Wretched of the Earth from, by Franz Fanon, who was an uh, Afro-Caribbean um, um, psych psychiatrist who um, practiced psych psychiatry and um, um, wrote uh, in the context of uh, Algeria at the time of the, um, the War of Independence against colonial France. So in this book, Franz Fanon aims at understanding anti-colonial violence. Um, he, um, he doesn't glorify anti-colonial violence, he doesn't condemn it either, but rather aims at figuring out the root causes of such violence. Um, so he says, in a colonial setting, violence is atmospheric. It's everywhere, in every aspect of um, society. It's everything that the colonized has ever known. And violence begets violence. So the colonized are not inherently violent, but are forced into violence by the colonial situation. So using the, because there's, they see no other alternative for them um, to reach freedom and independence. So using this framework, we can try to understand Hamas's violence, not with the purpose of uh, um, romanticizing it or justifying it, but with the purpose of developing a response to this violence that is both ethical and effective in actually eradicating it. The other author um, that I, uh, the other book that I would like to quote is uh, Frames of War, When is Life Grievable by Judith Butler, who is a Jewish um, queer feminist philosopher. The book was written in response to the war in Iraq in 2003. Um, so um, in this book, Judith Butler says that our modern institutions mediate reality for us framing some lives as valuable or grievable and others as non-valued or non-grievable. We are all influenced by our systems of power who presents to us lives of Americans and Israelis as valuable and grievable and, life and um, bodies of Arabs, Iraqis, Palestinians as non-valued and non-grievable. They say in the book also, we should reject the notion of non-violence as a stance of righteous purity we should stop, stop looking for the perfect victim. Um, we children are innocent, but besides that, none of us is pure and none of us is perfect. We are all somehow complicit with um, guilty of systems of powers in, and systems of injustice. So, and uh, there is not such a thing as the perfect as the perfect victim. Um, Israeli soldiers have been committing atrocities and have mocked and vilified Gazans, and yet this does not mean that Israeli civilians deserve to be the victim of terrorist attacks. Likewise, uh, Palestinians in Gaza cheered at Hamas as they came back from um, uh, Israel on October 7, and yet this does not mean at all that uh, Palestinians deserve uh, the punishment that the Israeli government has inflicted upon them. So keeping these premises in mind, we can um, start looking at Hamas complex identity. Uh, Hamas is a very hard movement to figure, in, to figure out because it is at the same time a political organization who holds power and run Gaza a social welfare organization that provides social services so deeply needed and so desperately needed in Gazan society. And this aspect of Hamas, uh, the service, uh, social, economic, uh, the welfare services that it provides are really at the core of its activity. 90% of Hamas budgets go towards these social services. Um, and this is through the social services that uh, members of Hamas are socialized into the movement. 
Hamas is also a terrorist organization, a terrorist group that uses terrorism as a tactic rather than an ideology. Um, so as a means to an end. Uh, so this means that it is at the same time true that Hamas is part and parcel of the fabric of society in Gaza and in, to some extent in the West Bank. And at the same time, it's true that Palestinians, civilians uh, are not uh, responsible for, uninvolved with, and often unaware of uh, the um, military actions that Hamas uh, performs and conducts. Also, Hamas is simultaneously a resistance uh, movement and an institution of power. Now, there is nothing strange per se in the shift from resistance to power. There's plenty of examples in history of such shifts. You can think of the IRA in Ireland, for example. But what's peculiar about Hamas is that he made this shift without really abandoning its violent past and without making peace with the enemy. Hamas origins are in uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, which um, so um, a, a branch of the Muslim Brotherhood was established in Palestine in the early 1940s. So the Muslim Brotherhood is um, a socio-political organization founded in Egypt in 1929 by Hassan al-Banna, and uh, the organization focused mostly on Islamization of society, mainly through um, education. Um, in the 70s, the Palestinian versions of the Brotherhood, under the leadership of um, Sheikh Ahmad Yassin, developed educational, social, religious, and welfare programs, which led to the increase of its popularity. Once again, these programs are really at the core of Hamas action in Palestine and on, uh, at the core of Hamas, Hamas history. Here, the goal of this um, political, social political action was where to serve the people and shape the good Palestinian Muslim. Um, the overarching idea was that the Palestinian mind and soul had been destroyed by uh, the uh, Nakba and by the occupation, and the route to national redemptions was through uh, re-establishing in Palestinian society Islamic principle and proper Islamic conduct. In this phase, um, Israel supported the growth of Islamism in, Pal in, the, in Palestine, um, mostly by not obstaculating it and by providing to Islamist organizations uh, the, the permits that, are, that were necessary to operate. Uh, Israel did so because it saw Islamism as an antidote, an antidote to the secular leftist guerrilla that was raging at that time. Um, by the 80s, though, the brothers uh, apolitical, the brotherhood, the Muslim brotherhood apolitical path had caused its support to the window. Uh, the Muslim brotherhood had participated in um, the war against Israel of, in uh, 1949, but after that, they refused to engage in any military action against Israel. Um, so, um, some members of the Muslim Brotherhood, including uh, um, uh, Shaikh Yassin, uh, felt like a different path, a different set of actions were needed, uh, and that uh, not being involved in politics was not an option anymore. Mm -hmm. So Hamas was created in 1987 during the first Intifada. And from the get-go, it was really clear uh, that for Hamas, quote-unquote, military operations had to be carried out exclusively within the borders of Israel and the occupied territories. This represented a sharp contrast with the leftist guerrilla uh, groups that instead conducted the terrorist attacks, like hijacking over airplanes, also in other Middle Eastern countries and in Europe. In 1988, Hamas uh, published the famous charter, so the founding document of the organization in which, in which its basic principles are outlined. This document it is, is an embarrassment for Hamas to the point that uh, Arab historian um, uh, Azam Tamimi defined it as Hamas' main enemy, most dangerous enemy. This text has different several characteristics. It displays the merging of Islam and nationalism as two forces that really work hand in hand. It presents Islam as an active resistance, as a call for actions, as a call for justice. It presents jihad as a self-defense carried by a fortified society 
that is a society in which Islam is fully established and fully and properly practiced. He presents Palestine as a vakf, so a divinely ordained endowment given by God to Palestinians for them to take care of it until eternity. Um, it does not recognize Israel. It presents ambiguity regarding the possibility of future recognition and presents some problematic anti-Semitic language, including citations from the protocols of the elders of Zion, um, which presents some of the worst um, anti-Semitic tropes like um, Jews having control of world politics. The, the charter also presents a justification for the attacks on civilians. It claims that, this, that such attacks achieve a balance in sufferings, that settlers can be attacked because they are themselves armed and routinely harm Palestinians, which is true. Um, Israel, it also claims that Israel army has a policy of universal conscription, so everybody has to go through military training in Israel, regardless of gender regardless of sex. So everybody is technically a military person, although um, this reasoning falls apart when terrorists attack, target um, children or um, elderly people, but that's part of the reasoning. He also claims, uh, uh, Hamas in this charter, that Palestinians do not have the power to militarily defend themselves in conventional warfare because they are not a state and they do not have an army with a monopoly over violence. And so their only choice is to create such a strong fear and insecurity in the mind of their occupiers, military and civilians alike, which will force them to withdraw. Um, so here again, we can see how uh, attacks on civilians are a tactic, not so just a means to an end, not um, an ideological stance in itself. Um, in 1989, the Intifada became more violent, and Hamas started to use firearms and explosives against Israeli forces. And in 1991, established, um, a for formally established a separate military wing, the famous Izal Din Al-Qassam Brigades, which are named after the Shaikh who led military operations against um, mandate British authorities and um, Zionist settlers in the 1930s. Um, also, uh, Hamas broke completely with the PLO, the Organization for the Liberation of Palestine, guided at that time by Arafat. In 1993, Israel and the PLO signed the Oslo Accord that entailed mutual recognition and a gradual handover of political autonomy to a new Palestinian authority, um, the PA. Hamas did not recognize, did not recognize the peace agreement. Uh, because they claimed um, the PLO had conceded too much to Israel um, and because in the agreement there was not a clear timeline and clear steps to be taken to establish a truly independent Palestinian state. Um, so this would uh, let uh, Israel not be fully accountable to an international community in actualizing the peace agreement. Um, so, because they disagreed uh, with the PLO and with the Oslo Accords, they boycotted the first election of the Palestinian Authority, which were born, won by Arafat, and between 1994 and 2005 conducted a series of suicide bombings attack against Israeli civilians, mostly in cafes, buses, um, public squares, uh, really creating fears at the heart of Israeli society. The first attack in 1994 was a response to the slaughtering of 29 Palestinians who were praying in a mosque in Hebron, in the West Bank, um, by um, a, um, um, a radical um, violence um, Zionist settler named um, Baruch Goldstein. In 2005, the, um, the suicide bombing attacks ended, were ended by, um, by uh, Hamas by unilateral decision. Um, so Israel pressured Arafat and the PLO to contain Hamas, which it did, creating more strife within Palestinian society, trying to separate these two factions of uh, um, the Palestinian political milieu. Meanwhile, the PLO lost support due to our authoritarian style of government, embezzlement of funds, and extreme in cooperation with Israel. So in 2006, Hamas, par Hamas participated in and won the elections for the Palestinian parliament because of its increased popularity and because of the, the diminished popularity of the PLO. 
After a failed attempt at forming a government of national unity with the PLO, Hamas took control of Gaza, whereas the PLO remained in control of the West Bank. And most Palestinians feel that this was one of the worst things happened to Palestinians um, after the Nakba, because it really separated these two parts uh, of society that should be should have been united and uh, um, made. Um, and, and, and this is something that um, Israel could benefit from. Now, at this point, as Hamas was in power in Gaza, Western uh, powers, Europe, the United States, Canada, had two options. One, they could have recognized uh, Hamas as a legitimate government in, an hope, in hope to moderate uh, Hamas and restarting a peace process with Israel. Option number two was to completely isolate and ostracize Hamas in a hope to eliminating it and um, giving space for the PLO to be the only legitimate representative of the Palestinian people. Now, obviously, uh, as you know, um, Western powers chose the second option. Um, and I think that in that there was a missed opportunity to start um, dialogue, to, to resume dialogue and, and a peace process. Um, the choices uh, made by Western powers also resulted in economic blockade, diplomatic isolation, political pressures, which all had disastrous consequences for the economy, the welfare, um, and the lifestyle of the people in Gaza. Hamas also made mistakes in this space. It showed inflexibilities in terms of um, reworking its original principles. And um, he presented, it didn't make a clear distinction between its role as a government and its role as a movement, because it has this complex identity. So thus giving a Western audience the impression that um, Hamas, that Gaza was run by terrorists, where in reality there are different factions in Hamas, um, and that they, they, they not that and the, the the military branch often operates not in in uh, connection with the, um, the rest of the movement. Um, Despite all of this inflexibility, Hamas did evolve over the years. And in 2017, they released a new charter, um, which was the result of thorough consultation within uh, the movement. Hamas operates based on uh, a system that they call uh, democratic centralism, meaning that any decisions, any changes to, um, to uh, documents, um, to uh, establish principles have to be fully discussed and agreed upon by its more or, or its main uh, its four main constituency. So its bureaus, uh, its bureau abroad, the members in Gaza, the members in the West Bank, and the members who, who are detained in Israeli prisons. Um, attempt at reworking the, the charter had been done since 2005, and some of the Hamas um, uh, spokespeople had hinted at those changes, but they were officially made in 2017. This new charter is very pragmatic and represents a triumph of politics over resistance. The references to theology are abandoned in favor of a decolonial observational lens. So the charter makes references to um, colonization theory, decolonization theory, apartheid, um, international humanitarian law. Here, clearly, there is an attempt of using a secular framework and a secular vocabulary to appeal to an international audience and um, to present um, like the Palestinians' right for self-determination within the framework of international human rights and international humanitarian law as an attempt to appeal to the conscience of Western societies. Despite all of this, ambi like uh, ambiguities remain in the charter, especially with regards uh, to the, its relationship to Israel. So I would like to quote some of the articles of the charter that I think are most relevant and most indicative of the shift uh, Hamas has made. So Article 16 says, Hamas affir affirms that its conflict with the Zionist project uh, is with the Zionist project, not with the Jews because of their religion. Hamas does not wage a struggle against the Jews because they are Jewish, but wages a struggle against the Zionists who occupy Palestine. 
Yet it is the Zionists who constantly identify Judaism and the Jews with their own colonial project and illegal entity. So here we have a clear attempt to reject previous anti-Semitic trope, but I also would like to um, draw attention to the word entity here. Um, Hamas describes Israel uh, consistently as a Zionist entity or an illegal entity. And this language has been adopted by Israel itself uh, with regards to Gaza. Starting from 2007, Israel has routinely defined Gaza as uh, um, an enemy entity or a hostile entity. And in this choice of vocabulary on both sides, uh, we have an indication of the refusal to engage and respect international humanitarian laws, because international humanitarian laws regulates the relationship between two independent states or the relationship between um, an occupying force and occupied territories, but what law exactly defines the relationship between two entities. Article 20 claims, says Hamas, I'm reading, Hamas believes that no part of the land of Palestine shall be compromised or conceded irrespective of the causes, the circumstances and the pressure, and no matter how long the occupation lasts. Hamas rejects any alternative to the full and complete liberation of Palestine from the river to the sea. However, and this is the part that it's important, without compromising its rejection of the Zionist entity and without relinquishing any Palestinian rights, Hamas considers the establishment of a fully sovereign and independent Palestinian state with Jerusalem as its capital along the lines of the 4th of June 1967 with the return of the refugees and the, um, the displaced um, and the displaced to their home from which they were expelled to be a formula of national consensus. So this is an important step because here Hamas is still clinging on to the notion that uh, um, the whole historical Palestine belongs to the Palestinian people, but the fact is in accepting the possibility that uh, a two-state solution might be in the it, it might be in the future of this land. Um, so this is they consider like the, the emphasis on uh, um, the boundaries established in 1967 with Jerusalem and its uh, uh, with, 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 uh, with um, the Palestinian state within those boundaries with Jerusalem as its capital and the right of return of the people that are expelled. This is an opening clearly towards a two-state solution, an ambiguous one, but nevertheless an important opening. Another opening is an, in Article 29, uh, which says the PLO is a national framework for the Palestinian people inside and outside of Palestine. It should therefore be preserved, developed, and rebuilt on democratic foundations to secure the participation of all constituencies and forces of the Palestinian people in a manner that safeguards Palestinian rights. Now, this is very subtle, but it is a tiny recognition of Israel because here Hamas is recognizing the PLO, who itself is an institution that has recognized Israel and has um, entered a peace accord with Israel. This um, here, I think there was another missed opportunity. Um, has um, these uh, changes and this shift made by Hamas were not taken seriously um, by Western powers or by Israel. Um, and uh, so the, the charter did not have, did not yield the, result, the results that Hamas had hoped for. Hamas had hoped for um, an end of its isolation, an end of the economic blockade, an end of the siege, and start of more talks with Israel and with the, uh, with the Western power, with Western powers. Um, this did not happen, um, unfortunately. Um, right after the, uh, the charter was released, uh, uh, Netanyahu um, broadcast a video of himself uh, uh, wrapping the, the piece of paper, the charter, and throwing in a garbage can, saying uh, Hamas is not fooling anybody. So overall, um, Hamas was on a path of uh, uh, moderating its position and choosing pragmatism over ide idealism. Uh, before October 7th. 
And the, uh, the, the events of October 7 are in sharp contrast with this trajectory. Um, so to me and to, to lots of political analysts, uh, uh, it is unclear yet uh, what exactly prompted uh, October 7. Um, it's still a matter of debate. Um, some scholars um, claim that, um, like, think that Hamas was um, offered um, some help uh, in terms of military action, financial um, military support, or like um, actual military intervention by by Iran and sympathetic movements like Hezbollah. Um, in the but then this help, uh, this promise, did not materialize after um, October 7. And other scholars instead point to the various events that in international politics and within Palestine and Israel that preceded October 7. So what are those events? One is Trump's, uh, President Trump's uh, Middle Eastern policy. So Trump's, uh, one, uh, so Trump's decided to move the American embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem in a highly symbolic move um, Jerusalem is considered the, the capital of the Palestinian state by Palestinians. So this move was um, a um, was welcomed, as you can see from this picture, uh, uh, by Israel, but um, was um, was in, like interpreted as um, a ratification of the status quo and the occupation as a complete normalization of. Um, the annexation, the occupation, and the blockade, the siege by the international community. Also, Trump pushed for the Abraham Accords uh, signed between Israel and uh, four uh, Arab countries, uh, um, Bahrain, the Emirates, uh, uh, Morocco, and Sudan. Um, and these accords aimed at normalizing the relationship between this country and Israel. And those are countries that historically have been uh, pro-Palestinian, like supporters of Palestinians' rights. There was also a series of protests in Israel um, against the government of Netanyahu, but these protests focus all exclusively on internal issue, of issues internal to Israeli society. Um, the protests did not tackle the problem of the occupation at all. In fact, the last five election cycles in Israel have not um, fe have not featured any debate about the occupation, as it was as, as if it was something that Israel had not to worry about and that could that could continue intact uh, uh, without problems. Another important event was the Great March of Return in 2018. This was um, a series of peaceful protests, nonviolent protests by people in Gaza who marched towards the boundaries, the borders with Israel, uh, symbolically indicating their right to return to their homeland. Um, so there's um, the, as soon as those um, as soon as the protests were approaching the bon the boundaries the borders they would met with fire um, and with violence. Um, Palestinians continue to march every Friday for over um, a year for over a year and um, as a result. Uh, 214 Palestinians were killed, including 37, 47 children, and over 36,000, including 8,000 children, um, were killed. So all of these events put together uh, might have um, given Hamas the impression that the status quo was, un like, was not sustainable anymore, that um, like the situations of the Palestinian had been completely normalized, completely forgotten by an international audience, um, had been completely accepted by the Israeli society. And so they felt, they might have felt like doing something as irrational as um, October 7 was the only way to shake um, something and start thinking and push the world to start thinking about Palestine um, again. And I don't know how am I going doing on time. I can stop here and see if there are questions. That would be okay. great. It's twelve thirty six. Um, 
also, I do want to hear what else you have to say, but let, it's a good idea to take a pause for questions. Um, also, let us open the chat back up. So folks can put questions in the chat and read them themselves, or Greta or myself will read them for you. You can also raise your hand if you want to ask a question. And then just as a reminder for anybody who missed the introduction, if you are a student or somebody with Palestinian heritage, um, we're going to move those questions to the top of the stack. So, and you can let us know um, that you hold those identities by putting an asterisk in front of your name. And we're having a little pause for thinking and formulating questions. Oh, great. The, someone in the classroom wants to ask a question. We are ready for you. Kano? Is it Kano or Kano? Either's fine. Oh. Okay, great. Lay it on us. Oh, yeah. What is this? <laughs> um, yeah, thank you so much for joining us and for um, just taking the time to talk through this history, um, and I also really appreciated the framing with Fanon and Butler. Um, I wanted to ask, in your research, you were mentioning um, how currently Hamas is simultaneously operating as a resistance movement and an institution of power, and um, they're sitting on the line there, but you also mentioned that historically there have been resistance movements who um, have transitioned more completely into being um, an institution of power or a government. Um, so my question is, what is it about Hamas that relegates them in especially the eyes of Western powers to being a terrorist group? And um, why does the West resist um, recognizing the other half, um, the institution of power half? Um, or is there like wisdom from other resistance movements who have successfully managed to um, dodge the their terrorists, let's just shut them down, rhetoric and become legitimized government institutions? Yeah, that's uh, um, that's a great question. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I think that um, there is overall um, beyond Hamas um, a great um, a great misunderstanding, like a great misunderstanding about um, terrorism. And this is one of the um, legacy, unfortunately, of September 11 and uh, 20 years of war on terror. Um, like the notion uh, um, that um, it. Like after September 11, to the notions that we do not negotiate with terrorists and war is the only possible response to terrorism became very embedded in our society. Um, like I, I don't know. Um, like my husband tells my children sometimes, my toddler, when they are having temper tantrum, we do not. I do not negotiate with terrorists. I'm not gonna give in into your requests. Now, this is a joke, of course, but it's like it's indicative of the fact that we are so um, like used to the idea that we can't um, we that, that that we just cannot have a dialogue with terrorists because they are irrational. Uh, and this is because we don't understand um, the I mean, I don't think that any terrorist terrorist attacks are. Um, ethically justified ever, um, but there is an anti-colonial impulse behind them. And this is something that the Western world is completely missing. Um, so like there is an under, there, there is a lack of understanding that war is neither, from my perspective, war is neither an ethical nor an effective response to terrorism. Um, 
20, like the situation in like what happened in Afghanistan is a clear example of this. Um, uh, Bin Laden was killed, but as soon as the um, the U.S. withdrew from the United from Afghanistan, the Taliban went back into power. Um, so um, it's not effective because the what pushes people towards terrorism are the injustice, uh, the economic um, the economic inequality, um, and um, the the violence that they themselves are subject to. Um, so war that simply doesn't work. Um, and so the Western powers applies all of this framing to um, Hamas as well. Um, there's also there's um, there's other issues such as um, we tend to conflate uh, all the terrorist groups. Um, for example, in Israeli propaganda and in some and in, in Israeli and pro-Israeli propaganda, sometimes uh, often I've seen um, Hamas uh, ISIS written with an iPhone, like like an iPhoneated monster, Hamas slash or dash ISIS. Hamas and ISIS are widely different movements. They are they have so many. Um, differences. Um, for example, Hamas, uh, Hamas's roots are um, like intellectual roots are in um, um, Islamic modernism. So, any reading of the Quran aimed at adjusting Islam to the, situ the conditions of modernity. Um, Hamas's roots are uh, intellectual roots are in Salafism. So, and a very strict literalist interpretations of Islam, of the Quran, and Islamic law. Hamas has a deep connection with its uh, uh, base, with its social base, so because of all the services that it has provided over the years. Movements like Al Qaeda, ISIS, have no social base. They have no such a connection. Uh, Hamas just focuses on Israel and Palestine and does not conduct terrorist attack outside of Israel and Palestine. It's very, very nationalistic. ISIS has criticized Hamas. They're very critical of Hamas because of their lack of engagement with global jihad. They say they're too narrowly, too selfishly focused on Palestine and on their own liberation rather than thinking about the global jihad for the victory of Islam in the in the entire world. Um, so these are, um, there's a lot of misconceptions and a lot of uh, um, it, like um, lack of knowledge that doesn't allow Western power to create, to have responses uh, to uh, Islamic terrorism that go beyond war and destruction. Um, and the movements uh, that managed to, to um, instead make the shift uh, towards uh, institutional politics, uh, at some point were given uh, um, an opening. Of course, they cooperated. Uh, they cooperated in uh, um, in the process of abandoning their violent past, uh, just not using weapons, like giving up weapons and becoming a part of the national politics. But it's a process that needs to um, to the, the the two constituencies. If it's making yeah, it was a long answer, but yeah. Thank you, Francesco. Okay, so I am going to read some questions from the chat. Actually, I'm going to read one question at a time. This question is from Joel, um, and it says, if there are indeed openings to recognition of a two-state solution, what prevents Hamas from removing their declared intent to remove Israel from the river to the sea? Yeah. I think that's also a very good question. I think they are terrified of making the same mistakes of the PLO um, because they feel like the PLO have betrayed the Palestinian causes by conceding too much to Hamas, uh, to, uh, to Israel. And um, they, um, they, they have, they, they, yeah, they have conceded too much. And um, so this is a clear, like this refusal to recognize Israel is a clear distinction between the PLO and uh, um, um, Hamas. So I think they are, um, they, they fear that they will lose support. So they will lose their um, ideological stance, their 
high moral grounds from from their perspective that's their high moral grounds um and they're um and they will go down a slipper the same slippery slope that the plo went through um that's my understanding they are very um but i know that simultaneously um they do um want um like there, there's been several spokesperson like uh, positions papers interviews with representative of Hamas, in which they have said that we do not think we, we they say we do not think i'm paraphrasing that israel should be there but it is there and it's not going anywhere so like pragmatically speaking this is a reality that we have to face and uh, we need to um, so deal with it, and so we are ready to um, to um, go for a two-state solution. And they frame it as a hutna, so a temporary truce, as a temporary solution. So I understand how this might um, might be not reassuring from an Israeli perspective, but it's at the same time the only it's a route for possible uh, for possibly starting a peace process. There. Okay, thank you. Um, really quick, Maria, can you, um, would you stop sharing your screen while we're doing oh, the yeah. question part? Thank you. Yeah, sorry. Okay, Joel, I see your second question, and I also see the asterisk by your name. We're going to, um, because you asked a question already, we're going to take a couple other questions first um, and get back to your second question. Scott, do you want me to read your question or would you like to read it? Uh, I can um, I can rephrase it uh, to make it more specific. Up to you. So um, I was wondering if uh, there's a likelihood that um, Hamas will kind of follow in the footsteps of the PLO. Uh, it seems like they have kind of a similar uh, trajectory, maybe. Uh, they start as a movement, then they become a political party, then they get into government. And then they're kind of out of government because another party takes its place. Uh, uh, do you see the do you see uh, Hamas going through a similar evolution as the PLO or different? Um, maybe kind of a general uh, compare and contrast in terms of uh, the PLO and Hamas. I think it is possible that it will follow the same uh, trajectory um, because um, uh, the PLO did start like the, 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 at, at the origins of the PLO, there were terrorist um, attacks and they were hijacking airplanes uh, and uh, um, they were considered a terrorist organization um, and they um, Hamal, uh, the, the PLO did not recognize uh, uh, Israel for a very long time. And when the Oslo Accords were signed, um, the PLO still had the non-recognition of Israel in its charter. So at that time, uh, so in this case, the recognition of Israel was a consequence, uh, a result of the peace accords, not a prerequisite for the peace accords. Um, and the same is not like for Ham Hamas is, is asked to recognize Israel as a prerequisite for any dialogue. Uh, but if you, you you see that what I'm saying in the, the like the, the difference there. So um, I think that based also on what happened with the PLO, that there is room for further moderating Hamas position. Um, if you think that. Um, the PLO reached this more moderate position and became a legitimate representative of um, the, the the legitimate representative of the Palestinian state in the eyes of the international um, opinion. Um, after also a story of non-recognition and violence. Um, also, the PLO was aided uh, uh, by the success of the Intifada, which was a largely nonviolent movement, uh, and by the sympathetic opinion um, that um, the Western audience had towards the Intifada. And like nonviolent, more recent nonviolent attempt at uh, bringing up the Palestinian issue, like the BDS movement, the Great March of Return, have also not. Um, generated the, the same sympathy in the Western audience that um, the Intifada had generated in the 80s. So I think it's possible. I don't know if it, but I don't think it's an impossible scenario with the right conditions. 
Also, the Oslo Accords, uh, I want to point out that the Oslo Accords were reached because at that time, uh, there was the, the, um, uh, the presidency of Bush, like, um, and with uh, Baker as Secretary of State, they withdrew financial aid from Israel. There was the one and only time in the history of the U.S.-Israel relationship where U.S. withdrew financial aid and forced um, the uh, enforced uh, uh, Israel to sign to, to start a peace process. So all of this to say, I think it's possible, but it's not going to happen if there is not a shift in perspective and a shift in attitude in the Western world as well. Okay. Hi. A lot of things to pay attention to. And the next person is Barbara. Barbara, I know you put a couple questions in the chat. Do you want to pick one and read it? Do you want me to read one? You're muted, Barbara. There we go. Yeah, got it. Thank you. So I'd like, can you comment on the reality that any movement to express opposition to the Israeli occupation um, of whatever variety it is, frankly, from something that is absolutely peaceful, like the Great, Great March to Return, or any of the things, the um, uh, picketing or the, the the little marches that they have done on a myriad of occasions on the West Bank, anything like this is met with violence and um, uh, some really punitive actions and is subsequently supported by American political systems and some other political systems in the quote West. But, you know, in the, in the days of Mandela and uh, the mm. seeking of an end to apartheid, everything was like, you know, applauded and we were, you know, people were boycotting South America, South Africa and all of this. And yet this group of people that is facing a very similar unfortunate situation is is tagged in this way persistently consistently as if you should not have any opposition to being um uh oppressed um uh abused or uh having an entity occupying territory that's a lot i know no i mean i um um, I, I it, it's really disheartening to see all of this happening, and uh, um, I think this has this has been um, this has been made possible by the extreme racism and complete dehumanization of um, Palestinians. And um, yeah, I don't know if I. Um, I mean, historically, there have been uh, a repression of um, like students' protests uh, for against the first students were, were protesting apartheid, the war in Vietnam. Um, so it seems to be a recurring, uh, um, a recurring uh, um, theme in history, and it's history repeating itself. Uh, uh, but in this particular case, I really think that we have reached a level of dehumanization and that. Uh, we haven't seen since the time of slavery, maybe. I um it's like 15,000 children dead, like 16 children killed, children killed. It's a heavy number, and it's really uh, hard to see how this doesn't move consciences. And to me, it's possible only when you really stop thinking of the other as a fellow human being. And it's that's only again. Thank you. Yeah. Great question, Barbara. Thank you. And great response, Dr. Yeah. Tedesco. Nathan, you've had your small hand up for so long. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, I, I have a question about the state of Israel. I mean, they are claiming that um, Hamas is a terrorist state, even though they, they're on the record funding them, and they are on the record committing terrorist um, strikes like the USS Liberty. Uh, and on top of that, you know, they um, 
uh, have sterilization programs towards other Jewish people of Ethiopian descent. So at what point are we going to start to acknowledge that they are the terrorist state and they're just uh, hearkening back to an old trope, I mean, of uh, 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 religiously persecuted Europeans who were persecuted in Europe and using that as an excuse to steal brown people land like the uh, pilgrims of America. Yeah, I um, I think that um, this is another... Um, so there are two more legacies of, uh, 20, of 20 years of war um, on terror that I think have been very detrimental for our international system of uh, justice and international law. Um, and one of them, um, one of them is this um, constant, um, this constant, uh, um, this uh, constant crisis of accountability um, of um, crimes committed by Western powers and Israel that have not been punished despite uh, clear evidence of uh, um, infringements of human rights uh, um, and uh, um, breach in uh, the, the Geneva Convention. For example, there have been uh, two reports um, so far, like one, the Goldstein report in uh, 2009 and an ICC invest like led by the UN and an ICC investigation into 2021, both have widely um, demonst like, um, demonstrated the, like, that Israel has committed um, has committed war crimes uh, in uh, the various wars against Gaza. There have been, uh, uh, this is the sixth war starting from 2007. Uh, so there is this, and, and there is like what the US did in Iraq was also illegal. Uh, and uh, um, from an international uh, humanitarian law perspective, there were torture, that, that there was not a case of a just war. So this in constant crisis of accountability is, one of the things we have inherited from our past um, and um, the definition of like the restrictions of the definition of terrorism only to non-state actors is another incorrect framing that we tend to have and i do have the definition of terrorism here and just since i have it i want to put it it's uh, um, the academic consensus definition of terrorism is there is no any legal specific definition but the closest uh, definition that has international consensus that we have is this revised academic consensus definition. And um, it talks about, like this is, it, it's long, but I'm gonna just read an extract. Terrorism refer on the one hand to a doctrine about the presumed effectiveness of a special form or tactic of fear generating coercive political violence. And on the other hand to a uh, conspirational practice of calculated, demonstrative, direct, violent actions without legal or moral restraints, targeting mainly civilians and non-combatants, performed for its propagandistic and psychological effects on various audiences and conflicting parties. Terrorism as a tactic is employed in three main contexts, illegal state repression, propagandistic agitation by non-state actors in times of peace or outside zones of conflict, and as an illicit tactic of irregular warfare employed by state and non-state actors. So this definition tells us that state can be the perpetrators of terrorism. That's not that our, in our political discourse, uh, um, terrorism is confined to non-state actors. Where the, like the, yeah, hoping, I hope it's, I'm gonna stop here. Thank you, Dr. Tedesco. There are still so many questions in the chat and we have to end now. I'm sorry. Um, thank you, Dr. Tedesco. That's the thank last you. thing I want to say. Thank you thank so much you. for your time, your energy. Thank you to all who joined us and asked questions. Um, once again, I am like, there's a discussion that needs to be had within the Seattle Colleges community based on the talk and the chat and the questions that came up. And I don't know where and when that space will be, um, but we will think about it within the library and welcome any input from y'all. Um, I love what's happening in the chat right now. Uh, yeah, I will end. Thank you, thank you. I also, I put the cozy feedback form in the chat and some links to our website and some more information resources. And just wanna say that the librarians are available 
if people want to do um, more research on this topic, we'd be happy to help look into some of those questions that we didn't get to. Yes. Fact checking as well. If there is such a thing anymore. <laughs> yeah, I'm checking all the... <laughs> okay, thank you all so much. We'll see you. There is a COSI next week. I'll be sending emails from library.central. Hope to see you there. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.